Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, if you are joining us from the East Coast or Europe. My name is Brian Francis. I am a contributing editor at GamaSutra.com and community manager for GDC. Um, if you are watching us right now, thank you for joining us. Um, you hopefully are familiar with the game we have right here because it was just announced last uh, Thursday at the Game Awards. Uh, the game is Hades from Supergiant Games. Um, it is available on the Epic Game Store in Early Access, which is a first for uh, it's the, the company that made it, Supergiant Games. Uh, with me in the lower left-hand corner of the screen uh, is Greg Kasavin from that company. Greg, how are you doing? Doing great. How are you? Good. Uh, as you can see, uh, I am. this is footage of me playing yesterday afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, we can't play live, so if you're watching from home, uh, feel free to mock my terrible gameplay. Uh, some, of these, some of these runs you're about to watch were not great. Some of them were actually pretty good. Um, but what I'm actually very happy about, and we'll get into this, is that all of them were actually very fruitful, even if they didn't go well. Um, Alex, you're here. You're plunking away at something. Yeah. Who are you? Why are you here? Uh, hey, I'm Alex Warrow, an editor at GamaSutra.com. Uh, I'm not quite sure why I'm here other than I'm excited about this game. Greg, will you tell me real quick, if you can, um, why early access? Uh, and how's that going for you? Uh, I guess there's a weekend already, but um, yeah. how's it going so far? Yeah, um, th that's uh, the second part is is uh, faster to answer. It's it's been we've been really really happy with how it's been going so far. Um, thankfully, the you know even given the early access nature of the game, the initial like sort of and it's a computer game as well. Like the initial sort of technical issues and technical challenges and so on were pretty minimal. Um, so everybody was for the most part able to get into the game and start playing. The the response we've been getting. We've been really, really happy with. Um, I will never, ever take for granted just like having a group of our players just actually like the stuff that we work on. I will never take that for granted. So every every time we launch a game and and our players say, hey, this is cool. Thank you for making this. I'm like, I, I wipe the sweat off my brow and I breathe a sigh of relief. And thankfully, um, that response has been really encouraging. Um, as for why early access, uh, mm -hmm. we... Uh, we conceived of that aspect of this game like with kind of as part of the whole package right from the start It was like mm -hmm. a high priority when thinking about what we wanted to make next uh, after our last game Pyre uh, came out last year. Uh, we were really interested in a game that we could like Kind of develop out in the open once it reached a certain point and and make it the best game it could be uh, by by gathering feedback along the way by kind of building it in partnership with the community uh, for us it opened up so many uh, possibilities uh, not just from like a from a game design perspective but also even from like a narrative perspective uh, like from my standpoint as as the writer on our games uh, being able to work on a game whose story could unfold kind of a little bit more serially instead of having to sort of put the entire thing in beginning middle and end right in that initial launch so um, the, we, we think of this early access launch of Hades almost like the pilot episode of a series or something like that, where it's a lot of the setup, you meet a lot of the characters, and you figure out what the conflict is all about, but uh, the, the kind of resolution of the story is not all uh, in the game yet, and we'll roll out new characters and more events in the story uh, over the course of the early access period, along with just improving every other aspect of the game uh, with any luck. Right on. I'm gonna really. I'm gonna do some uh, housekeeping before we continue our interrogation. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, Craig. Um, folks in chat, uh, we are taking your questions. Uh, we've already got folks asking about what other platforms Hades will be launching on. Um, Greg's addressed that elsewhere, and there's also an FAQ that talks about the other platforms. So we've dropped that info for you in chat. Um, which brings us, uh, but if you have questions, um, we especially want to keep them developer focused so that Greg can talk about, uh, how the, how Supergiant brought this game to life. Hopefully so that if you're a game developer at home, you can learn yourself. Um, uh, Greg, which, uh, talking about platforms means we want to talk about the Epic Store, I guess. Yeah. Um, would you walk us through, like, the decision making behind going to the Epic Store and what was different about it compared to your past experiences with Steam and other platforms? Yeah, so like a lot of it does uh, tie back to the early access nature of the game and that being like really key to the to the whole design from our perspective. Mm -hmm. So that meant that, you know, if we were going to develop this game um, out in the open for a while and we expect early access to, to last for, for more than a year on this game from our initial launch, we, we need to be able to uh, move on it kind of really quickly. Uh, we 
so we knew we couldn't we we knew for sure that we weren't going to launch early access on a whole bunch of different platforms at the same time that would severely that would basically make it uh, close to impossible for us to update the game in a timely fashion um it just it, it, our so our team size is fewer than 20 people maybe there are some teams out there uh who can uh, kind of who are really effective at uh, patching games on many different platforms all at the same time, but that is not uh, a skill set that we possess uh, as a small team, and we felt it was vital to be able to focus on a single version of the game uh, until we get the game to a really good state, and then you know during that process we could start to look at uh, other platforms toward an eventual uh, multi-platform launch. So that's very much our plan. Um, we uh, so as we were working on Hades. We uh, got in touch with the folks at Epic and started to learn about what they were working on uh, with their store, and we became really excited for it. Uh, it. It just seemed like a really good fit, given uh, the experiment that we were making and the experiment that they were making. Like uh, one of the factors uh, with Hades is we want this game to be um, highly enjoyable to to watch as well as to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a, a game designed around like immediacy and replayability among its factors. You just, just kind of get in there and uh, hopefully start having fun with it and have a unique experience each time and have the action be kind of very, very readable if, if, you're, if, if a friend is next to you or you're streaming it or something like that. And part of the thing with uh, it, part of Epic's focus uh, just in general and I think with the, with the store is to, uh, to help um, enable content creators, like streamers and YouTube content creators to sort of like get a essentially get a piece of the action you've seen you you've seen the fortnite uh creators uh what's it called i think supported creator program Mm -hmm. uh, where where creators basically can just get compensated for their work and i think streamers and youtube content creators have had such a significant and and overall beneficial influence on games over the years that it's really only fair that they should uh, be able to benefit um, more from the incredibly hard work that they do. So on a personal level, that spoke to me. I think it spoke to other folks I work with just as part of the the priority that um, uh, yeah. that, that that Epic was interested in. But anyway, that that's all stuff that they could probably speak to better than I can. Those are just some of the reasons why it made sense to us to go sort of conduct our early access experiment off to the side because folks on other platforms uh, who are familiar with our games are used to our games being like 100% complete. We've said in the past that uh, we really value the completeness of our games. So mm-hmm. folks on other platforms one day will get the kind of experience that they are used to from us. Um, and on the same timeline as we've delivered our games on in the past where you know typically they take uh, Transistor and, and Pyre both took us about three years to make. So basically along that, uh, we expect Hades will be done on roughly that same timeline. So we figured if you're just if that's the experience you're accustomed to and the experience you want to have, nothing has changed. <laughs> you'll you'll get to play our completed game, uh, hopefully wherever, uh, in as you know in as many places as we can support and make sense of uh, once once we're out of early access. But for now, uh, uh, we it made sense to us to run early access on on the Epic Games Store. I hope that explanation seems reasonable. No, totally. I um, and we have a bunch of good questions already in chat. We'll get to them yeah. in a minute here. Before we get off storefront entirely, um, I gotta ask. And you know, we understand you don't speak for Supergiant as a whole, but just as a as a veteran developer yourself, how do you feel about the proliferation of uh, of game storefronts in the latter half of this year, especially with uh, Epic, obviously, and and Discord and a couple others? Like, um, how are you feeling about the business that you're in? Is yeah, it exciting I- times or confusing? What? Uh, it is exciting times. I mean, I've been yeah, as you as you may know, I've been around the I've been around the block a couple of times because I used to I used to work in the gaming press way back when you know since, so I've been I've been, I reported on games for you know like, ten years or so, uh, more than ten years starting in the '90s and now I I've been in game development for more than ten years. So I think if you've been around long enough, you know this stuff kind of goes in cycles, um, and it's. And it's aligned uh, often with like the console cycles in particular, like the what what happens in the computer game industry is sort of there um, on the periphery of what's going on in the in in the console industry. So new consoles are announced. There's a ton of excitement, um, uh, and and um, it, but but as as new console as consoles so, sort of grow old, then uh, you know PC 
platforms tend to take priority for a while and they kind of hopscotch each other uh, over the years and the cycle keeps turning that way. And new platforms rise, uh, older platforms can fall. Uh, sure. that's, that's always been the way of things. So I think uh, broadly that we're just kind of at that point in the cycle when new platforms start to get announced. Um, and it's, it, it's definitely an exciting time because uh, you know you can't help but want to uh, sort of start even if you're doing it only in your head you start to you know bet on whichever horses you think are gonna win the race and you start to wonder you know who's who's got the right who's got the right angle on what's going on who's gonna sort of thrive and prevail through all this and uh, who who might fall by the wayside but um, uh, generally it's like it, it's it, it's absolutely a good thing like anybody investing, um, in in the game industry, creating more competition for the platforms that are out there, uh, it just makes things better for for everybody when when we have more uh, choices as as game players. I think that's the bottom line. So um, yeah, I, I, I think it, for me it's exciting stuff. As someone who's followed the industry for a while, it's like oh man, what's what's going to happen? I'm excited by by the unknown uh, in the game industry, and I think that's always been part of the appeal to it for me. That I uh, despite you know, despite how long I have been following it, I, I cannot predict it. <laughs> Anyone who thinks that they can predict it, I, I don't I don't believe that person. It takes many surprising twists and turns, I think, like pretty frequently. That's one of the truest things I've ever heard on this stream. <laughs> um, I'm going to springboard off of Spizik's question. Um, uh, you're launching early, into early access. Early access has been a thing on Steam for a while. PlayStation and Xbox have begun to support it. Um, the difference between uh, Epic, the Epic Game Store and other platforms is that it, it's supporting different forms of uh, interactions between uh, devs and players. Um, could you break down like what that's meant for you as a team? This player specifically, Spizix, like has questions about the lack of a forum, but I do know that you guys have a Discord because that was sort of the first yeah. thing that was part of the trailer. Um, so, so what was the difference in changing player communication for you guys? Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, I think one of uh, one of Epic's things is that it it I think they very much want for the relationship between the developer and their uh, and their player base to be as direct as possible and um, kind of not filter through them. So it, and and it's also a new platform, right? So it's not going to have like it, it just doesn't have uh, as many of the robust features yet as Steam has developed over what what's it been fifteen or twenty like a too, long time very long. Yeah, Half Life Two came out. Two I almost said too long and the before time. Yeah. So yeah. so. Um, but yeah, you know, in our case, the response, the onus is on us, um, and it's been we have our we've actually been uh, we launched our official Discord server uh, earlier this year, somewhat quietly. We've been building it up a little bit uh, over the months. Now, you know, now I think players who look back at that decision, it may make a little bit more sense to them. But we've um, we've never like for our part, we've never had our player community in a in a central location um, because because there are like. Um, forums and other pockets of community, you know, in in different uh, places on the internet or whatnot. So launching our official Discord is uh, for us is a place where we, you know, we finally have our own uh, kind of homegrown community there. And if you play the game, you'll see it's kind of right there, linked in the main menu as as a means to uh, get in there and talk to other players or talk to us, uh, share feedback. Um, so um, I I think. We, we thought about having like a forum and stuff as well, but the, we we liked the vibe that Discord provides and we already had enough of like a groundswell um, of players there. I, I mean, there's other stuff like uh, I've seen folks point out, it's like, oh, there are no, there are no like user reviews on, on the Epic Games Store. I'm sure I, I, don't, I can imagine something like that might be added at some point. We're an early access game. I, I don't, I, I think we're of course very open to folks reviewing it because we charge the same $20 that a non-early access game might charge. So uh, we stand by the quality of our game and so on. But you know, if, if you want to f uh, find reviews and opinions on the game, yeah, you'll have to look elsewhere besides the actual storefront. But I think, uh, on, personally, I think it's not difficult to find opinions about products on, on the internet um, <laughs> if, you have to, if you have to turn elsewhere. But I, I, so overall, I don't have a ton of opinions about like the direct feature comparison of the Epic Game Store versus other platforms. We we felt it was a good fit for what we were trying to do. But, uh, you know, as with all aspects of the game, 
Um, if that's something that players have uh, feedback about, I'm sure we'll be hearing about it as as will uh, the team at Epic, no doubt. Mm. Yeah, I um, there's a good question here in chat. I wanna I wanna get to before I forget. It's from Miss Jim Cloud, and they want to know what was the vision you had when you first came up with uh, the concept for Hades. What is the what is the sort of driving goal here, um, sort of as a game? Like, what was the goal to uh, beyond wanting to get an early access? Was it just to make a game that had been on someone's mind for ages, or was there a specific uh, thing you were trying to pull off with this game? Yeah. What was it? What's yeah, hope for it? you know the the vision. I, I started smiling because because it doesn't it doesn't quite work that way around here. Um, but but um, the in 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 my role, um, uh, uh, really, I'm I'm one of the people who helps formulate the ideas that we then pursue. And one of the things I look for uh, as as the highest priority is like what. What is the overlap of, of preoccupations on the team? What, what do the most people here want to make the most passionately? And that's the game that we should make. So we started having, uh, very soon after Pyre uh, launched, like within a month, uh, that game spent three years in development. We were already eager to go on and figure out what our next thing was gonna be. So we started having uh, many, many hours of conversations. And some themes uh, started to emerge from that. And one of the one of the ideas I already spoke to is like wanting to develop a concept that we could continue to build on after it was out there. A, a game a game idea that was extensible and not just like a kind of a one and done game similar to our last three games. Mm -hmm. So that was a high priority for us. Um, and we were very intrigued by a design around replayability, kind of a, for for lack of a better term, like a more a modern design sensibility than than maybe some of our previous games that are just uh, like kind of have a more linear uh, campaign structure. You finish them, hopefully they'll stick with you, you know, forever on an emotional level, but they're not necessarily games designed to be uh, replayed uh, many many times. We were really drawn to making a game that felt very immediate that you could pick up and play in short stretches or play, you know, kind of for as long as you wanted it, wanted and still have a compelling experience around that. And then we started thinking about what theme uh, uh, would align well with that. We thought about, you know, do we want to revisit one of the worlds that we've created in the past because we love those worlds and that's, you know, stuff that's like, we while we've never returned to one of our past games, it's not something that we are like morally opposed to or anything like that. We just mm -hmm. You know, don't want to do it unless uh, the time and circumstances are right. Um, and and given given our other priorities, uh, it felt like once again, let's let's make something new. Let's make something that really really fits this set of design goals. Um, and and we looked to uh, Greek mythology in this case as a source as uh, in in one in one sense a well worn theme for video games, but in another sense something that we felt was um, both a perfect fit for what we were doing and also in some ways like really underexplored um, in certain uh, in certain respects, uh, particularly our uh, our angle, we think on the I, I was uh, as as the person doing the writing, I, I was very drawn to a particular uh, angle on on Greek mythology that that I feel is is very true uh, to the the source material um, yet is often sort of lost in the shuffle of how this type of material tends to be adapted, which mm -hmm. is the gods uh, are a big a dysfunctional family that we can see ourselves in. Um, yeah. There, you know, I think part of the reason these characters have survived for thousands of years is because they they relate uh, so strongly uh, to, to so many people and, and they relate not because they're gods, but because they're human. Um, so we wanted to explore some of that. It felt like a really flavorful, uh, um, it felt rich with, with, with potential for us. So yeah, we started, we started making it. So that's a long answer, but yeah, you know, I have a more concern, yeah. like we wanted to make a roguelike dungeon crawler where you defy the God of death, you know, yeah. it felt exciting to us uh, to, to figure out what that game was gonna look like. We love playing uh, roguelikes. Um, we, we've been really inspired by some of the early access successes over the years. These games like Darkest Dungeon and Slay the Spire uh, and, and Dead Cells, uh, games that started off 
really strong. Like from the moment you dropped your you know, $20 on them, that was like money super well spent. And then they only got better and better from there. So we're like, oh man, what if we could, what if we could pull off something like that? That's kind of what in our mind's eye felt like the right way to do it. And we felt that if we knew it's gonna be early access from the start, and rather than doing it as kind of like a, oh, you know, oh God, we ran out of time, let's put it in early access. If we plan for it to be early access, maybe that improves our chances of, of handling that kind of process properly. Yeah, um, look, man, this is video games. No one's going to get mad at you for making a roguelite dungeon crawler. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right, um, right. We want to make games that feel that feel fresh also. Like, I, 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 really, I really value games that feel like they have kind of a reason for, for being, like that just don't feel like um, they're, you know, just kind of the same as other games that are out there. But I, I, I think what we've made has uh, has plenty of our you know, dirty signature all over it and has its, has our has our particular uh, marks on it to make it feel distinct. It has Gen um, it has Gen Z's like, really good art all over it. Yeah, Gen, Shout Gen out to Gen Z. Z. Director, uh, she, yeah, I, 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 I think she is one of the, I, 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 I don't know. Hopefully she's not watching this, but I think Gen Z is one of the greatest artists working in the industry. It, it's a huge honor to be working with her. Uh, she kind of reinvents her style on every single game. Uh, we've worked on. She, she's of course uh, just one member of our art team, uh, though she does create the 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 overall uh, sense of style and the look, and does all our wonderful character designs and everything. So I think uh, her work, the work of Darren Korb, our audio director, does all our music and uh, contributes key voices to this game and all the sound effects. He is a uh, man of many talents, and his his work has of course uh, really. Uh, helped our games uh, always stand out over the years, and I, I think this game is no exception. So it's always exciting to see um, what what my colleagues will do on each new game, and that's I think for us it's been part of the fun of uh, kind of choosing a different theme and and setting uh, every single time. Uh, yeah, oh, go ahead, sir. I'm gonna. I'm going to springboard off of uh, Vogir's question in chat. Vogir sort of was asking about, is this a roguelike? And I think you just sort of answered it by yeah. comparing it to those other games. I want to, I want to, uh, he, Vogir's asking about like kind of the depth of in comparing and comparing it, asking if it's comparable to Binding of Isaac and to the Gungeon. Yeah. I would like to ask you, how does Supergiant Games define depth? And in kind of a, like, how did, how did you sort of build yourself a, a, a template for the layer? Like, we're sort of looking at some of the systems right now that you guys used with the mirror. Um, how did you look at your design experience and say, this is how we can make depth that will update, that we can both, like, layer with what we ship first and then update over time uh, in kind of the way that uh, Vogir is talking about? Yeah, so so depth uh, in games, I think, works on, on many... Um, on many vectors, so mm -hmm. we have, uh, so we have, uh, we we aspire to having gameplay depth, and we aspire to having narrative depth as well, and hopefully the two together create an overall very, very rich uh, feeling experience. But I, I, I think you're referring more to, to gameplay depth, depth. So let me speak to that. I, I think like we we look for we really really value uh, in out in each of our designs uh, for our past games um, the sense that you can kind of discover different successful play styles as you go. Um, so we, we really favor designs that let you experiment, that give you sort of the latitude to experiment, that encourage you to try uh, different things and, and kind of experiment with different tools within the, the context of the gameplay. And then, you know, just when you find what feels like a perfect combination, like a kind of a very effective uh, set of skills and tools and abilities and so on, Maybe you get nudged into a new set uh, of tools and abilities that uh, is is even better, or maybe just different in an intriguing way. So I think if you look uh, to each of our previous games, they've all done some version of that. Uh, but in the case of Hades, I think it like really synthesizes a lot of what we've um, a lot of I think our best ideas from our previous games um, in in Bastion. There was this goal around immediacy, like it's a game with very little preamble. You just pick it up and start playing. And we wanted you to get right in there with Hades and just just immediately get uh, j just fi figure the gameplay out like a very low uh, accessibility barrier. Uh, but uh, but at the same time, it merges together an aspect of Transistor that was very exciting, which was 
this idea of uh, combining different abilities, making for thousands of different possible combinations, and that's very much uh, at play in Hades uh, here, where you have um, the, the Olympian gods essentially provide you with uh, different blessings, kind of like power-ups, that you, you can't necessarily control which of these gods you encounter, but you can choose between the blessings they provide. So each time you play, you're sort of like building out your character in a unique way. So sometimes you'll be able to play and kind of go down a specific path that you really want. Like, oh, oh you're using the bow and you know that Poseidon uh, happens to cause enemies to get knocked back away from you and that forms a very powerful uh, combination that you could use. But other times, you know, you're not gonna be presented with exactly uh, the options that maybe you were hoping for and you'll have to make do. Um, and that also, I think, uh, feels feels true to work we did in Transistor and Pyre, where it's about kind of like making the most of a situation that you can't entirely control uh, in some cases. So we find that that makes for that kind of that kind of structure uh, can make for gameplay that uh, continues to be surprising and interesting over time, and just defining enough uh, overlapping systems. Um, that can interact with each other to where you know suddenly uh, richness emerges from the play experience and in our own play testing we find that we're not having the same experience over and over we're uh, we're compelled to start new runs uh, that's all stuff we really really look for nice I um I cannot think about the fact uh, a question or two ago you didn't say it out loud but you were you were talking about moving early access and you almost sounded relieved this idea of um, not having to wait three game three three games three years to put out a game sort of get it out quickly get it start iterating on it um i'm by curious the, by know, that like, math uh, three games is nine years alex yeah yeah exactly so like i wonder um how has your process changed internally both for you specifically and yeah. i think you observe in the team um working on a game like this where you've sort of got to be ready to go um, yeah pretty early as opposed to having having the luxury of three years to crunch on um, a masterwork or something. So, like, tell me, how has your process changed practically as a as a writer and developer? Yeah, it's a really good question. Our process has changed a lot in anticipation of this, and again, it all ties back to, like, I, I guess I didn't um, say this specifically, but like, a really key aspect of this whole game for us has been that we've we've just planned it more uh, in general, and part of it is anticipating an an early access launch and sort of, I almost equate it. Um, I hope this is like doesn't sound too obnoxious as, a, as an analogy, but it's like, it almost felt like training for a marathon or something like that, where we, um, we've basically moved internally to a monthly milestone uh, cadence. So every month uh, we, we have a milestone uh, where we have certain goals and, and the, the month is divided up uh, into certain phases. So we have, um, at the beginning of a milestone is when we could make more major changes uh, to the code and so on, and then uh, we we lock the code down. We could still make data changes, so uh, fine tune things. Uh, you know, from my standpoint, I could still be uh, adding uh, new narrative events or changing uh, the the voiceover and stuff like that because that's all uh, d that's all part of a data driven system and is not like fundamentally you know altering the code uh, by me adding or subtracting events. Um, and then uh, toward the end of the milestone, we're we're uh, then you know testing, bug fixing. Uh, polishing, making final changes to get everything ready. And then at the end of that, we play test and then we, we kind of do it over. So we've been doing it, we've been working this way for, for a number of months now, uh, knowing that basically once this game is out there, we're just gonna keep doing that. And those uh, major updates become major updates that we're like committed, you know, we're committing ourselves to. If you if you quit out uh, to the main menu, you'll see right there like on, on the main menu that it says, when our next major uh, update is coming, that basically is aligned with our internal milestones and when uh, we, we think we'll have a, a whole batch of, like, from our perspective, cool new stuff uh, ready to go. So that really has been the biggest shift uh, in, in our internal development, whereas uh, with a, with a three-year project, uh, our milestones at this point in the process would be much longer, would probably span you know, two and a half or three months uh, and be somewhat more nebulous in nature, uh, I would say. So it's a more, um, I think in a word, it's a more disciplined uh, approach that we're taking, but we've always valued uh, planning and, and production discipline at Supergiant. I think it's been key to our success that we've been able to just, it, you've heard from many developers, I'm sure, that 
finishing a project is really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard to, to decide it's time to wrap it up and to make those really tough choices uh, about um, about finishing your game. So it kind of, we, we've learned a lot about that over over nearly 10 years that we've been working together as a team. Um, and, and so this, this project sort of puts that uh, forward. Uh, and of course, it's a little scary to commit to um, like major updates on a regular basis, but we we've been practicing at it. We think we think we could do it. Obviously, nice. So. Cool. Uh, Alex, can I s slide in with some folks from chat? No, absolutely not. No, I was going to just keep talking. I was going to just keep Deny. going. I'd fight. please no, please by all means go ahead. <laughs> Roger. Um. Uh. We can we can sort of step back to your 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 good old creative director stuff, Greg. Um. The Lord Gersh. Uh. Would like to talk about the themes of death and rebirth that have showed up in all of your games. Um, Hades is literally about death and rebirth, as you have seen on the stream, where I die repeatedly uh, and then get reborn and die again. Um, what other outside influences, like you talked about uh, why you landed on Greek mythology earlier, but what uh, what have you looked at in the real world to make you think about uh, telling stories around death and rebirth like that? That's what Lord Gersh would like to know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a uh, that's an in interesting question. I mean, I th I think um, it, it it's really it's really tough to it's tough for me to pin down because it's my entire it, it's like it's got to be my entire outlook on mm -hmm. things. I, I I seek to work on stories that 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 feel uh, that that feel meaningful to me, and I think that's the only chance I have of those stories connecting with other people out there. So there has to be something there that that I feel is true, and that I I can spend a whole lot of time just trying to dig for to uncover. Like if mm -hmm. it's something with just a, a simple answer, like a simple moral, to me that's not sufficient for a story because there there's just not a lot there. Uh, but in in this in this game's case, you know, I don't know that death. I wouldn't death and rebirth for sure. I can see how that would be construed as like a recurring theme through our games. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but Hades, uh, to me, is a game um, about family. Uh, and, and I look to my own uh, family experience and the, exp uh, and the family experiences of other people I know and other people I've heard about. Um, and of course, the family experience is described uh, in the world of Greek myth as, as one of the kind of most uh, fundamental sources of inspiration for, for the kind of stories uh, that this game will have. Of course, mm -hmm. that sounds, you know, that sounds maybe, I don't know how, how openly I would admit that outside of like a, a GDC uh, live stream because uh, of course we want it to be, uh, it's like an exciting hack and slash experience on the face of it, but our mm -hmm. games, I think if you know, if you're familiar with our games, you know that our stories are always about something more than what's there on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's pretty clear pretty early on when you you know meet Cerberus or whatever uh, as like an old family dog that you know that this is kind of like a um, there's there's a bit of a family drama or or a family comedy I should say uh, underneath the surface of this game. Um, but I mean I, I I can't I can't tell you I can never answer like what are my inspirations. <laughs> it's just too many. It's too many things. I play a lot of video games. I try to read, I try to watch movies, I listen to a lot of music, like, I, I don't know, I'm the sum total of the, all the experiences I've ever had, and that informs, that informs my work. Right on. Well, I would love to know um, sort of how your work has changed in the last couple of years uh, as your team, well, actually, I don't even know. So there's a question here in chat that has to do with team size and bringing new folks in. Can you talk a little bit about how um, Supergiant has changed since you've been there, and specifically since Pyre launched last time we talked? Yeah. Um, so the I think one of the things we're really proud of at Supergiant is um, all seven of the folks who created Bastion together. We're all still here uh, mm -hmm. working. We've worked on each respective game in our same relative roles. So that's I mentioned uh, Jen and Darren and it's myself, um, Amir, who's our studio director and essentially like our design lead and Gavin and Andrew. Um, uh, who are our, uh, our engineers, and then uh, Logan Cunningham, who's provided a major voice or more or more than one in each yeah. of our games. Mm -hmm. uh, so each of us uh, has continued to work together, and since Pyre, we've been... So uh, I should say, after Bastion, 
we were um, we grew from seven to twelve people, uh, and uh, we were joined. Our art department expanded uh, with uh, Camila Vanegas and, jo and Josh Barnett, uh, and and we uh, and and basically we like have more. We have more of a support team and a business development team, and folks like Michael Ailshai, who just handles so much of our day-to-day uh, -day operations at this point. Um, so we we became more of like a complete team after Bastion, but we stayed at that number twelve for many many years, and and that only changed after Py, uh, after Pyre last year. Mm -hmm. We realized, uh, with uh, given our plans uh, for Hades, that we uh, we needed it was it was time for us to grow a little bit and to shore up what we felt were like essentially some of our weaknesses at that point um, with uh, and 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 so we have more we have more design muscle now we have more art muscle and we've grown um, from from that number 12 to, to closer to 20 uh, at this point that's yeah. the size that we're going to stick to uh, hmm. because we think that being small is like really fundamental to how we operate or like I mean who who know who knows what the future holds? But we all know for certain that uh, if we 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 like we couldn't even th this 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 space that you see we fit everyone into this room like this is our space. Uh, if we we just don't even have room for more people. So we want to would rather constrain our ideas to what we can achieve with this team here than just like have the mindset of growing bigger and bigger um, because we think that a lot of our best ideas are are really only possible because of our small team size it's just how we work and and how we sort of negotiate through uh th through creative ideas as well so that um that's been a big uh and really exciting change over the last year to like have have new blood on the team and and um and see how much of an incredible impact uh, these folks have had across across the board and you'll see them their their names are all in in the credits in Hades, and and they're all on our team page and everything. You can find out more about everyone who works at the studio that way. Nice. So that's um, a good opener for Alitian's question, which is um, I don't know if they're a developer or a fan, but they want to know what's it like taking all these new people into the team um, versus starting with a very small team and passion. Um, so how how is the uh, how is the vibe in the studio workflow changed now that you've bumped up to twenty? Has it been a, a noticeable thing, or does it just feel yeah, it's 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 noticeable for sure. I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons we approached the process of expanding the team like really, with with a great deal of caution and I and hopefully care is that we know that even if you bring in the most talented person in the world, like the the abs absolute best artist or the absolute game designer, the the best game designer in the whole world joins your team. It yeah. still can have a profound. It, it can and will have a profound effect on the culture of the team, um, and and that has to be approached carefully. Like you have to look for, or I, I don't mean to be prescriptive. In our case, it was really important to bring people on board who 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 enhanced our culture, who uh, who contributed something more than just their work, uh, because they it, like it. It just each new person who joins changes all of the social dynamics here. Um, so we're, we're aware of that. Um, and so we just try to do our best to make the right choices, right? Um, and, and thankfully, those choices have worked out really, really well. And the, the reality is that we have new blood on the team and folks who are, you know, more, more bright-eyed and bushy-tailed than, than people like me who've been, you know, whatever, been doing this stuff for a long time. I, I'm, I'm, it invigorates the rest of us, right? like when, when done properly so that's thankfully that's how um it's worked out and we've always like in the past prior to some of these folks joining we've actually been pretty the word monastic has been used to describe us we were just kind of plunk our headphones on and work away and then leave at the end of the day like i i think i think folks out there may imagine us to be this like this group of people we all you know hang out and have beers after work it's like we're not we're not really like that usually. We're we're pretty focused on on our work, and a lot of us have lives outside of work, and we really value that separation. So at the end of the day, people go home um, and go go to the rest of their lives. So it's been really helpful to have new folks on the team who have like livened things up, and you know more people going out to lunch in larger groups and that that sort of thing. That's just made made things more lively than it, than they have been in the past and. 
I think the proof is in the pudding as far as the actual uh, work, because we've been working, uh, you, you know, Pyre launched in late July, and now we have this game uh, in December, and, and I, I, I think that some folks have expressed surprise or like, have you been working on this like all this time? No, we didn't. We didn't get started on Hades until after we were well finished with Pyre. So we, we've just, it's only been possible because uh, we're, we're bigger now than, than we were. Nice. Yeah, that, um, there's a good follow up here from Twindom who wants to know uh, sort of what are the core values of your workplace culture? That's like a kind of yeah. a... Man, shout, shout, shout out to chat for being really interested in like just like life quality of life in game yeah. dev. Thank you guys. Good questions, chat. Thank you. Keep them coming. You know, the, those are those are questions that we uh, are very interested in as well. And in fact, so so here, um, I hope I can rattle these off off the top of my head. So we, an interesting thing about us, maybe interesting for you to decide. We did not have stated values uh, as a studio until uh, last year. And we've been around since 2009. So we didn't do that because we were like dismissive of it. It's just because I think, I think it took us all that time to truly understand what our values were and to have some really, uh, to have some really frank conversations about it and, and seeking alignment around it. So like one of our, um, uh, one of our values for instance is we, we iterate on everything. That's, that's a core part of how we make games. An iterative, an iterative development process is, is just how we do it, and, and it's important for everyone here to embrace that and, and to like understand that, that reevaluation and criticism and feedback is, is, is part of the process. And, and that mindset is part of what enables us to, I think, go into an early access launch, uh, I think, with a, hopefully with a healthy mindset. Um, we also say that um, um, that work, our work is not, uh, our lives are not in competition with our work, that, that our work contours to our lives. So that's our view on how to manage a work-life balance. So here we have, um, as a small team, we, we have flexible, like, we would rather work around the challenges of people having flexible hours and working remotely, um, you know, coordinating remote meetings and stuff like that. Than, than requiring everyone to strictly be here always at the same place at the same time. We would rather enable everyone individually to, to, to position themselves to do their best work and to find the balance that works uh, the, the best for them while knowing that their colleagues are there to support them through that decision making and, and that, that we, we expect for, for people to be, to, to, be, to be honest with themselves um, uh, around it and, and, the, and the team uh, is is always recipro reciprocal around that as well. So like around here, when someone people are responsible for their for their own work here and and their own like uh, kind of um, uh, what like uh, for example on 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 the writing or something like that. It's like no one's gonna tell me no one's gonna like assign a bunch of writing to me or something like that. Like I'm I'm responsible for my own work. Uh, but but that that is a that is a big responsibility where we we are all actively involved in our own scheduling and knowing the value of making sure that uh, everyone has a life outside of work we schedule uh, accordingly and and try to schedule like very very conservatively to make sure uh, that there's time for everyone to to iterate and to do their best work and to not feel like they're just totally under the gun and again it's like taken us you know a long time working together uh, together to 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 figure out what what is a good uh, balance there? I think that's always a challenge for different developers to to sort that out for themselves um, and and in general. So those are a couple of our um, that that's giving you an impression of what some of our values are. But yeah, at this point we have, you know, they're they're not values that we like publicly print on our website, but that's part of them being true to us. They're not like there to they're not there as an advertisement for us. They're just how we. Uh, have grown to understand ourselves and and um, and understand our relationship to our work and to each other, and it's yeah, really I mean, out well. 
that's great. And, and forgive me for this nebulous question, but I think it's something that people think about when they talk about things yeah. like mission statements or values. Did codifying and making those explicit meaningfully change anything about the workplace? Like, did it make it easier or simpler? Did it speed it, up meetings? Like, what did it do, it, if anything? It really, in in our case, it was really valuable. For me personally, it was really valuable. Like, like the stuff I just talked about of work uh, contouring to your life, it yeah. really, my own personal mindset uh, toward toward my my relationship with my work and and um, and and just like how how understanding that it's not one size fits all was something that for me just like clicked once we once we did uh, put that uh, put that particular statement into words um, that it's a, it's a phrase that Amir our studio director uh, put into words you know having spoken to me and others about where everybody was at with respect to their work. It's like, what, what's the pattern here? What are, what are our expectations? Are we asking everyone to just slave away? You know, we're a small team. Should we just slave away constantly forever? Well, no, we can't do that because sustainability is our goal. We've been together for close to 10 years and we wanna keep going. If we just burn the candle at both ends forever, we're not gonna make it. So how do we find the balance of, of making high quality games that we can be proud of uh, while still living our lives, you know, and because the rest of our lives like empowers our ability to make the kind of games that we make. You asked about my inspirations before. Mm -hmm. My inspiration ain't gonna be just like crunching on my last project, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like that's not gonna make for a very interesting uh, video game over time and it's not gonna uh, make for a lot of uh, a lot of content variety. So um, it's really important for us uh, as a group of people, uh, doing creative work to to find an appropriate balance. We all care a lot about our work. We we love doing the work. So um, it, I think one of the challenges in the game industry can be for, for people to to even just like pull themselves away from work, know when to do that. But that's where I think a lot of our experience over the years uh, comes in. Uh, we as a as a team, we we all try to support each other, uh, catch each other when you know when we're uh, we made a whole game about this. It's called yeah. Pyre. Um, <laughs> about a group of people who have to who have to support each other through thick and thin, uh, come what may. So that um, yeah, I think I think we've learned a lot, uh, and and um, I, I hope it I hope it's expressed through th through this game that we're working on now. That, yeah, Pyro was an incredible game. Sorry, go ahead, Brian. That um that was a really intricate answer um to folks in chat we we're gonna wrap up in about 10 minutes so feel free to get your questions in i do want to get you answers for those questions uh so we're gonna sneak one in before i want to loop right back to the the discussion point we're on um there are folks asking about uh, like kid kidagine and others who are asking about uh content after the 1.0 launch greg yeah. uh, do, do you know if there'll be like just if there will be continued content updates like there are in early access or you said earlier, you know, once the products launch, it'll be the equivalent of a three-year baked super giant game from before. Yeah. It... Yeah, so we've always done um, like uh, our our kind of uh, game launches have never been the end of either uh, of mm -hmm. any of the projects. So I think I think it's fair to expect that we will continue to. I mean, it's all but certain. I would say to the extent that we are able, we will continue to support this game for as long as as players. Have interest in it. That's something we've always done with each of our games. So I, I think um, since since we do expect uh, early access to last for more than a year, uh, we we were reluctant to make a ton of promises about what will happen after yeah. we say you know it's reached the 1.0 phase. But I think I think our goal for sure is like if you know if if players are still enjoying the game, we'll want to keep uh, supporting it in the ways that make in the ways that make sense. Uh, and and at that point it. We, we would expect it to be available uh, in more places and be positioned to be able to support it in wherever wherever it appears. Yep. Uh, I'll just quick do another quick last call for questions so we can try and get them in. Uh, Greg, yeah, like I said, I wanted to loop back on that thread about um, uh, studio life. Um, this has been an interesting year to talk about that. I've, I've been trying to do my due diligence and ask whenever I can talk to team leaders uh, whenever I can, because this has been a year where we've had stories about uh, Riot Games, Rockstar Games, Telltale Games. Um, we've had closures. We've had uh, 
um, stories about uh, employees mistreating other employees through a, a culture of harassment. Sorry, and I'm not asking you to comment on those specifically, which is what I'm building to. Um, but I guess um, as as the industry has has talked more about this, um, how do you see like? And it's sort of it's sort of impossible to ask every company to do what your company does with regards to your values. Um, how do you think other game developers can work to improve their quality of life in ways like that? Just because I think now more than other, I, I think a lot of developers are very concerned about this because in some cases they feel sort of their health and their lives are on the edge a little bit, which is a bit dramatic. Sorry. No, I mean uh, they, they should. We studios should be concerned. Why shouldn't they be? This yeah. is this is this is about people's lives, um, so um, we we take it seriously. Yeah, you, you know, I, I have a certain point of view on this because my mother's a neurologist. She like helps people with really severe um, severe issues, right? So I just work on video games, so I can like on the one hand I can put my work into perspective, but but having said that, it's really like. People work day in and day out on this stuff, and a lot of people's lives do revolve around it, for better or for worse. So it, it is important, um, and studios owe it to themselves and to the people who work there to be introspective and thoughtful about it in their own way. But but have, but apart from that, it's like I can't be prescriptive about it. Yeah. I don't know that there's a. I I I'm I'm actually very personally like very. I bristle at the idea that there's like a formula. Mm -hmm. um, that, that there's like a prescription like studios must do this mm -hmm. these must be the work hours the, this must be the culture i think it really depends um and there are different studios in different parts of the world and with different team compositions and so on uh, that where it, it doesn't there isn't like a one size fits all solution for them and there there are studios of all different shapes and sizes that have succeeded and that have failed um and and those are all unique cases with something uh, for people to to learn from, I'm sure. Um, so, you know, in our case, we're we're doing the best we can here, based on our our experience and our observations of what other folks out there are doing. Our discussions with other teams, our discussions internally, the kind of trials and tribulations that we go through. Um, but you know, we when we started in 2009, I don't know that any of us would have assumed we'd still be around by now. You know, having launched our our fourth game, uh, we we would we might have been optimistic about it, but I'm, I'm sure we wouldn't have expected it. Um, so I think I think the truth is everybody is making it up as they go, and, mm -hmm. and these discussions that that happen out in the open are really important discussions. That that uh, I think if they cause uh, other developers and studio leaders to like take a hard look in the mirror or ask themselves if there are things that it, what blind spots they have, what are they not thinking about that maybe they should be. I think that's all good. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with this stuff. Games have like a really big impact on people. They're expensive. They take a lot of time. There are ethical issues around them. These are things that people should be thinking about uh, if if they want to make games. I, I'm I'm I hope we are bearing that burden ourselves as responsibly as possible. And I know that there will be people out there who tell us if we're not doing that. Um, so and I'm I, and for me it's like I'm I'm. In the grand scheme of things, I'm glad that that's the way it is. Um, that 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 um, I think I think there are forces in this industry that will that will keep you honest, and and I and I value that a lot as someone who comes from you know a, a background of reviewing video games and whatnot. Yeah, <laughs> right on. Uh, you know, having a neurologist for a mother. Um, yeah. So I, I hope that answers your question. I'm I'm glad I'm glad. The conversations are happening. They're really they're tough conversations, right? It's, yeah. it's tough to have all the context, um, and and it's easy for stuff to get taken out of context sometimes, and um, and people don't really and it could be awkward. And but um, it's 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 for the best for for some of the stuff to get out in the open. In in my personal opinion. Yeah. Well, I mean that begs the question: uh, Did the team crunch on this, and how did it compare to the crunch on Pyre and the crunch on Bastion? I mean, what do you uh, define 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 crunch? Yeah, right. So it's like, uh, did anyone? Did, did you feel like anyone was uh, had to put in extra hours? I guess above and beyond what they were willing to do in a way that negatively impacted their social life or personal life. N not beyond what they were. N no, I don't think. Yeah. So. Like they they um they 
there is never there's never been a moment in the history of this studio where it's like like now your hours are this but mm -hmm. i think i think that crunch is much more insidious than yeah. than uh, like the sort of for forced work hours it can it can often be that someone is in a situation where they feel uh, compelled like no one is telling them or forcing them but they feel like but they know that they have this deadline and so they're like triangulating the work that must get done in the amount of time so they force themselves to do it mm -hmm. uh, we've we've folks here have worked hard in the past for sure um, yeah. the the um, uh, but part of our growth on this project is to is to diffuse some of that work across more people uh, to so that so that it doesn't fall on as as few shoulders as, as maybe it has in the past um, but uh, you know, so, so yeah. I mean, I hope that. I I, I think the yeah. the other part of it is uh, that I should say is like, it was extreme. Like like every. Um, for example, we 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 worked we worked on on Saturday this past Saturday. Mm -hmm. we, we were launching our game on Thursday. We all knew we were going to work on Saturday for months in advance, <laughs> and we took the previous Friday off and stuff like that because we. We knew we had a weird week uh, coming up with a with a launch on a Thursday night, so we did uh, we we did a whole bunch of planning uh, around our launch week uh, just to give you an impression. Um, and and we um, um, what was the other? yeah the other the other part of it is knowing we were launching into early access. It was extremely important, uh, something that we talked about um, and and I think made good on um, over and over it, it, to to make sure that people went into this week as as well like. Unlike with a previous game where there can be a temptation to crunch toward the end because then you're just going to like kind of get a bunch of time off. Here, the early access launch is just the beginning. So we we can't afford to be all kind of uh, all tired and at our wits end and stuff right now. Like because the most important thing with a game like this is is the follow through on the launch. Not just no one's going to remember Thursday last week uh, in a few weeks. They barely remember it now. Um, what, what they're going to remember when they think about our game is is our pattern of of being able to maintain it, and for that, you know, that's back to the kind of marathon uh, training analogy I made before. It's, it's it's really about finding a pace that that is healthy for us, that we that we can maintain uh, comfortably um, and and take the time we need, um, and we we think we're well positioned to do that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Man, I would I would kill to have another hour. I would, but I I can't take no, it from you. Know where to find me. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, uh, we need to get, get a couple of these questions rapid fire out before we let you go. Um, uh, da, 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 um, uh, rah, 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 rah. uh, oh no, there were other questions. Um, Miss Jim Cloud, <laughs> we're gonna go back to you. Um, what was the greatest challenge that developed in this game outside of the work stuff? Like, what what was really great, like challenging, in what we're seeing on screen right now? Um. Man, let's see. <laughs> I think again I, another hour long question. Yeah, I think like the um, it, it's a whole it's an entirely new game structure. Uh, okay, no, I have I have uh, I know what exactly the thing is. Each of our previous games has been designed more as like a linear experience. Yeah. There's a lot of branching in games like Pyre, um, and there's a lot of like reactive voiceover in all of our games but generally speaking there's a beginning middle and end and you go through it in a succession so reapproaching this game to be designed around replayability is a is like a sort of a tectonic shift for us it's a whole like different mindset um in how it, it's a it, it's a whole new genre for us despite the superficial similarities uh in the combat game to, to something like bastion mm -hmm. so reapproaching you know both the gameplay um and the narrative knowing that this game is designed to be replayed is a big uh, shift in thinking and a big shift in the entire like underlying architecture of the game. And that was like, that was a, like a bite the bullet moment really early on in development where I was like, wow, this feels really different, but let's, let's keep going. This is exciting. Let's see what happens. That, that was like, it was the biggest challenge and, you know, a big source of excitement as well, just to, just to work all that out. Right on. I right on. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Greg, so much for joining us. That was a really great conversation. Um, uh, if you're at home, thank you to everyone watching at home. Uh, 
Oh man, we yeah, I'm getting a warning about. Um, we are about to keep rolling. Uh, the GDC Twitch channel will keep going with some great GDC talks. If you're an aspiring game developer, we would love it if you stuck around and just you know learned more about uh, how games get made. Uh, if you are a professional game developer, we hope you find something in there that's useful for you. Um, if you liked what you had today, we would love it if you clicked the follow button. Um, thank you, Super Giant Community, for showing up. And ironically, you can if you heard too closely, you heard the Bastion music playing because my phone went off in the other room. Uh, um, shout out to Darren. Um, thank you, Alex and Greg. Um, I suppose for Greg, I will, if folks have que other questions for you, I would recommend you check out the super giant games discord. You can literally see it when you boot up the game and I'm sure the link to it's on the Twitter as well. Um, or any other, their website. And with that, have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Watch GDC TV.